Sabbath. This is the show that we do every Friday evening as we bring in God's seventh day Sabbath with joy and celebration. We are so glad you chose to be with us tonight. We tried to put together some good topics for you tonight, topics you'll find informative and edifying. And as we celebrate the Sabbath every week, we give praises to our Heavenly Father and to our Savior Jesus who died so that we might have eternal life in His kingdom. And that's why we always pray, thy kingdom come. Yep. So we look forward to the return of Jesus when he's going to rule the earth as king of kings and lord of lords. I can hear like Susie Q talking about you. Know, <laughs> she always king of kings and lord of lords. Okay, Susie Q. And we're going to touch on this business of preaching the gospel to the world tonight. But we're going to talk about how it's important that we do it the right way because preaching the gospel isn't always being done the way that it should be in some of the churches so there's a right way and a wrong way you bet there uh, i'm is. looking forward yes. to hearing about that yes tonight wes is going to start off by talking about theory versus law and then we're going to have our special guest kelly mcdonald kelly mcdonald call, uh, all the way in from tennessee uh, and he's going to talk about the real Constantine. Now speak up, Kelly, because that's a long distance. Yeah, right. yell loud. Yeah. And always remember, this is a live show. We welcome your comments and questions in the chat room. We really do. So talk to us in the chat room. We don't. We do want to know what's on your mind tonight. And, and the reason we want to hear from you is because you're our brothers and our sisters. And when we all fellowship every Friday evening, it's so obvious that the love of God is out there among you. So. We appreciate the Christian agape that you demonstrate when we have these Friday evening get-togethers. Now, as you probably guessed, we've already had our pizza, so yep. we're ready to serve you. Yep. And I've got to tell you that Wes is one of those who, the one who goes out and gets our Friday night supper before the show, and it's always either pizza or burgers and fries. That's right. And then we usually have some kind of a neat dessert, too, don't we? Yeah, like cookies tonight. Cookies. All right. right. Yeah. So, Wes, I want to ask you a question. You yeah. know, you're always re reading books, Yeah, right? I like to read books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Wes is always reading something. Our house is filled with books, shelf, you know, walls full of shelves of books. So I've got to ask you, Wes, don't you understand that a diet of junk food will kill you? Uh, yeah, I understand that. Um, and something went wrong with the... Um, I, you, you supersized it, that's for sure. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about the diet of junk food getting ready to kill us, but I've got to get the script back on the screen. Right here. now it seems to just be affecting our eyesight or the screen or something. Yeah, something okay. like that. Okay, so um, how about I talk about the women's conference while you work on that? Okay, go ahead. All right, well, uh, coming up uh, um, April 21st and 22nd at uh, CGI.org in Tyler, Texas, or uh, online and at CGI's headquarters in Tyler, Texas, 
we are going to have the new church lady women's conference titled way dear matters we've got a great slate of speakers we're going to have interactive panel discussions and roundtable discussions we're going to uh, have music the uh, uh, CGI family praise education and prayer group band uh, they don't have an official name so I call them the pep uh, praise group is going to come and play in the early part of it so we're looking for special music people um, we've got Paula Hughes speaking I'm going to be speaking and uh, in years past we've had it um, off-site at uh, Timberline Baptist Camp but this year we're having it at the CGI building and that means that you can watch the women's conference everywhere that you can see CGI so on Roku YouTube at CGI.org on their Facebook page most of the conference on Saturday afternoon and Sunday are going to be broadcast there so the conference is officially 2 p.m. Saturday April 21st to about noon <clears throat> on Sunday April 22nd we're going to feed you you know breakfast and lunch on Sunday we're going to feed you lunch and dinner on Saturday there's going to be snacks mm -hmm. and we also have a special presentation of bots on the Friday night before I'm going to join uh, Brandy Webb and Lisa McComb on the set of bring on the Sabbath there at CGI and we're going to do uh, uh, women themed or Christian yeah. living themed uh, subject matter. So we're going to handle that. So it, there's a lot to be had. And if you didn't get to write all that down really fast, you can go to newchurchlady.org. That's newchurchlady.org. You can read my blog. There's a schedule there. You can register. Please register. Okay. So we know you're coming and we have enough food for you. You don't want to go hungry. That's so right. let's go back. Speaking of hungry. Yes. Uh, don't you know that a steady diet of junk food is going to kill you? All right. Now, I've read up on this, and, and, and here's what I'm, I'm I've surprised. learned. You've read okay. up on it. I have read up, and, and here's what I've learned. I'm not making this up. Number Probably one, fake news. I want to give you, no, this is not fake news. Okay. Right. These are five important points. Okay. Number one, listen. the <laughs> Japanese eat very little fat, and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. That sounds right. Yeah. Point number two, the people of Mexico eat a lot of fat, mm -hmm. and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. Oh. Number three, the Chinese people drink very little red wine mm -hmm. and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. Mm -hmm. Number four, the Italians drink a lot of red wine and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. Number five, the last point, the Germans drink a lot of beer mm -hmm. and they eat a lot of sausage, a lot of fats, uh -huh. and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. Wow. So here's the conclusion that I've come up with. All right. Eat and drink whatever you like. It's the speaking of English that will kill you. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I want to be serious. Okay, let's be serious. As I said, Wes has got all kinds of books yes. scattered all over this house. He's never happy to be reading just one book. He usually reads several books simultaneously. Well, you always want me to come up with interesting material for SOS, so I try to stay informed by reading a lot of stuff. All right. But some topics you are reading about are really a little silly, like the book you're reading called The Deep State. That's a good book. And that's the actual title of the book, The Deep State. Why, why do you think that's a silly book? Well, I already know a lot about the deep state. You do? Tell me something about the deep state. It's easy. It's Arizona. Arizona has the Grand Canyon, which is very deep. <laughs> okay. I don't think that that's what this actually, is. Actually, uh, been all right. there. All right. We want to thank Carl Noctri for doing what so many experts told us could never be done. Carl is out there in North Carolina. He's connecting our Facebook feed to our YouTube feed so that people can pick up the YouTube broadcast at dynamicchristianministries.org. Yes. So write that down. We've got a lot of new uh, people watching tonight. And always remember, you can go to dynamicchristianministries.org and watch our shows. You can watch the replays. Okay. And Carl posts the uh, link to the YouTube feed in the Facebook um, chat. So if you're looking for the link, you can find it there as well. Very so good. thank you, Carl, for your services. Let's open with prayer. Let's do that. If you'll bow your heads, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your Sabbath day. We thank you that Jesus sits at your right hand and intercedes for us on a daily basis. We thank you that it's by his blood, his shed blood, that we can have eternal life with you. So thank you, Father, for these spiritual blessings. Now we thank you for the technical blessings you give us of the internet and things like this, where we can fellowship together at the beginning of your Sabbath day and do things that we hope are pleasing to you as we study your Bible, as we learn more about you and your son. So please be with us tonight. Help us to fellowship and learn together in love 
We're so grateful to you for all these things, Father. We commit this show into your hands, and we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What do you got for us in the chat room tonight, uh, sweetheart? First, we've got Mimi and Carl with us, Reed Harding Bradwell. Roger Martin says, reminds everybody to hit the share button. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Hit the share button. Bob Petty says he hopes you're feeling better. I think most people can tell by your voice that you're still a little scratchy-throated, but you're, how are you feeling? I feel great. Okay. I, I, let me tell you, whenever I come on this show to be with you, I always feel great. So... Thank you for your but, love and your kindness. Right, and you weren't feeling great enough to do the show last week. Well, last week, no. I would have come on the show and just coughed and coughed. I would have coughed more than I could have talked. So <laughs> There you go. But I wanted to be here last week. That's right. Okay. All right. Charles Darby, the second, is with us. Kelly McDonald's watching. That's good, Kelly. Get your stuff ready. We're going to have you on soon. Uh, Hunchek uh, Trepara is with us. Farron Malek. Uh, Kathy Monahan. Abu Vanin. Edward Harding, Hi. Jeffrey Flum, I'm going to go uh, here, Tamilia Batista, John Paul, uh, Jacob Knight. Wow, new people. Fantastic. Beth Lane Mee says, happy Sabbath from Illinois. Cliff Packard's watching. Debbie Wilson's watching. Uh, Verge, Cordell, Verge Cordell says, happy Sabbath from Kentucky. Uh, Prophetic Route Channel is watching. Steve Wykey is watching. Bill Lucenhide. Hey, Bill, is watching us. Guten Tag, Bill, <laughs> or Guten Abend, or whatever. <laughs> Guten Nacht. How about just hello? Hello. Yeah. All right. Um, Larry. Uh, hmm. Just try it. Yeah, Mycelwick. Okay. Uh, James Marinek is with us, says hi, Wes. Um, Brian Renald, Mary Young Perkins says happy Sabbath. Um, Melissa James says, Happy Sabbath from Bethlehem, Georgia. All right. Uh, Greg Rick Largic is with us. Uh, Dennis Henry Sempe says, Happy Sabbath from Iowa. Judith McCarthy's with us. David Lind. Uh, Barb Shanks is watching. John Black is watching. Judy McCarthy says, Happy Sabbath from Cartersville, Georgia. Uh, Frederick um, Osiko is now, with us. Are they, is that YouTube or Facebook you're looking um, at? This is Facebook. Facebook. Okay, uh -huh. gotcha. Uh -huh. Richard Maxwell, Marsha Johnson, Ed Lambino. Wow, big crowd tonight. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Sunil Rawo, Amy Thomas, Benita Miller. Hey, Amy, hey. come back and see us again. Yeah, Amy, we enjoyed having you here yeah. a few weeks ago. Wes's guitar needs to be played. She probably got us sick. Didn't we get sick after Amy Thomas visited us? Uh, I got sick from you. I'm not blaming oh. it on Amy. Well, I'll blame mine on Amy. There you go. Blame. Um, <clears throat> Jocelyn Cor Coritana is with us. Olivia Doyle, Ron Griffin, uh, Jerry Stubbs, Sharon Murphy, Trish Farley, uh, Mike Simpy and De Mike and Denise uh, Simple are from Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, they say we need focus, but it looks focused on mine, guys. So hmm. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, Priscilla Hawkins is with us. Can you do Rahim that thing Shah. where you go touch the camera? I I'll do it, but I'm telling you, it looks, it looks clear on my right. on my uh, stuff here. Okay. Uh, Kevin O'Hare is watching us, better known as Kevin from Hessville. Uh, Ron Griffin said we got to have a good program tonight because he's watching. Okay, Ron. We'll uh, do our best. Denise Valesco says happy Sabbath. Gordon Wimberly uh, is watching. Let's see. Sharon Lewis says delightful Sabbath to everyone. You too. Uh, Stephen Acafali, Acapali is watching. Bill Evans. Um, Manuel de Jesu is watching. All right. Rita Bertaki is watching. All right. Let's pick up the rest of those after uh, we go through a segment, okay? Uh, put, put a marker there so we can keep the show going. A lot of new names here tonight. Thank you so much. We're really glad that you're being here tonight with us. We really enjoy your presence. Let's get into our first segment. And on our last show, Start Our Sabbath number 45, we took a few shots at the theory of evolution. And remember that on our last show, we talked about pre-flood giants. And the week before that, on SOS number 44, we talked about whether or not the pre-flood giants were the result of the union between angels and human women. So feel free to go back and watch those shows, SOS 44, SOS 45. You can find them on dynamicchristianministries.org. But don't do it now. Let's get back to evolution. Many times when a Christian takes exception to the theory of evolution, the atheistic and agnostic scientists want to talk about how ignorant we Christians are. 
And here's one of the things that they like to say to us. They say, so you Christians take exception to the theory of evolution. They say, well, why don't you try taking exception to the theory of gravity as well? See what, what that gets you. They say, try jumping out of a 20-story building and see if you're discrediting the theory of gravity doesn't do you in. And I've actually heard this. And this is nonsense. It's nonsense. Let's look at definitions. Because as I've said so many times on this show, those of you who watch us know that I'm always telling you definitions are important. So let's give the evolutionists some time to make their case. They say that in everyday language, the words theory and law are not synonymous. But they say that the term scientific theory and scientific law practically mean the same thing. And, and let me explain where they're coming from. They say that a scientific theory is an explanation of nature and that it's based on evidence. Hence, they say that we have the theory of evolution, which is not some theory as the word theory is used in everyday language. And they can play their semantic games all they want, but here's the proven fact. Evolution has not been proven. That's just a truism. Evolution has not been proven. There are way too many unanswered questions about things like missing links in the fossil record. And we have to point out that the reason that the idea of evolution is rejected by so many people, it isn't simply because it goes against God's word, no. That's just part of the reason for our rejection. The theory of evolution is rejected by so many people because it has absolutely not been proven. If the evolutionists were to actually prove their theory of evolution, we would embrace it because you can't deny proof. But the proof of evolution is simply not there. Again, they want to fall back on their argument about what they call things like the theory of gravity. And I'm telling you, gravity is not just some quote unquote theory. Gravity gets proven millions and millions of times every second of every day. And you can't say that about evolution. Evolution, unlike gravity, does not get proven millions of times every second of every day. All right, let's leave the atheistic and agnostic scholars to their misleading definition. Let's, you and me now, go to the real world where real people talk about things. And so much of this conversation about evolution reminds me of what the Catholic Church used to teach. They taught this for centuries. They, that church forbade the owning and reading of Bibles for a long, long time. They told the little people like you and me, they said, don't worry your pretty little heads off about Bible doctrine. They said, We'll have the priest read, you, read the Bible and tell you what you need to believe about the Bible. Well, some scientists today want to do the same thing. They tell us, oh, we know you have your little definitions for words like theory and, and law. They say, but don't, don't you worry about it. They say, just trust us with the definitions and with the explanations that we come up with. Now, let's be clear. Theology can be difficult at times. Science can be difficult at times, but if a priest or a scientist cannot convincingly explain his beliefs to the great unwashed like you and me, then he's not a very good teacher. Or, or maybe the information that he's peddling is just a bunch of nonsense. Either way, this is why a lot of people don't accept the erroneous speculation of atheistic scientists and agnostic scientists. Again, we don't reject the facts of science that are out there. There are facts of science out there, and those facts are absolutely true. And on this, this show, we bring up the facts of science all the time. No, we don't reject the facts of science. Instead, what we reject are the erroneous conclusions that are made by many scientists. Can you see the big difference between them? So let's move away from the erroneous conclusions of some scientists and get into the real world. Question, what's the most prominent definition of the word theory? And I'm talking about definitions that are put together by recognized linguists. You know, these people who create things like dictionaries and encyclopedias. What's the most prominent definition for the word theory? It's this, a theory is a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something. 
It's a set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. It's an idea used to account for a situation or justify a course of action. Now that's one of the main definitions for the word theory. And here are some synonyms for the word theory. And these aren't my synonyms. These synonyms are what you find in most dictionaries and encyclopedias. A synonym for theory are conjecture, supposition, speculation, postulation, proposition, premise, assumption. All right, that's our first question. Second question, what's the most prominent definition of the word law? And for the purpose of tonight's exercise, let's leave out legal definitions. That is definitions that are related to jurisprudence, the kind you find in a courtroom. That's, that's a whole nother world. The most prominent definition for law is this, a statement of fact deduced from observation to the effect that a particular natural or scientific phenomenon always occurs if certain conditions are met. Again, I got to tell you that a lot of these definitions that we're examining tonight were not created by farmers or blue collar workers or back porch philosophers. These definitions that I just gave you have been created by scholarly lingu linguists. So I hope that you can now see the difference between theory and law. And you know, a lot of scientists don't like when laymen like you and I talk this way. Again, they want to say that for all intents and purposes, a theory is really no more than a law, and that's not true. So be warned, when you come into contact with these people, these atheists and agnostics will try to convince you that a theory and a law are all, almost always synonymous, but they're not. And let's demonstrate this. Within these two definitions, let's look at gravity, and then let's look at evolution. When we look at the gravity question, do we say that gravity is a law? That is, gravity is a statement of fact deduced from observation to the effect that this particular natural scientific phenomena always occurs if certain conditions are met. Or do we say that gravity is a theory? That is, it's a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something based especially on general principles independent of the thing explained. Gravity is not a theory. Gravity is a law. In every instance in the history of man, well, let's say, let's put a qualifier, since at least the flood. In every instance in the history of man, jumping from something really high like a building or a cliff or a bridge, there has never been a case of a person just gently landing on the ground below. It doesn't work that way. Every person with an ounce of intelligence knows that Gravity will hurt you if you go against it every time. And this is not some intellectual idea or supposition. No, it's practicality. Gravity works the same way every time, all the time. Now, what about using these words theory and law on the subject of evolution? When we look at evolution, can we say that it is a law? That is, that is it's a statement of fact deduced from observation to the effect that a particular natural or scientific phenomenon always occurs if certain conditions are met. No, we can't. We can't say that. The idea of evolution is nowhere on the scale of gravity, which everyone knows exists. I mean, some people might not know the word gravity. Nevertheless, they still know intuitively that it exists because they're fully aware of what's going to happen to them if they jump off of a cliff. But it's not that way when it comes to evolution. It's clearly not a law as is gravity. And when we look at evolution, can we say that it is a theory? That is, it's a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially based on general principles, yes. And I wanna give the agnostic and atheist scientists the benefits of the doubt on one point in their belief of evolution. I will put my money on their sincere belief that evolution is the is the you know that evolution is the explanation for the creation of all things. I believe that they believe this. Now there may be some who don't believe it, but the ones who push this, I believe that they're very basically very sincere in this belief. And what's funny about this and their belief is that 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 oftentimes they laugh at us for our faith in God. Don't, isn't that right? 
don't they look down their noses on us because we have faith in God? Yes, they do. But then they've got all kinds of faith that they place in their unproven belief in evolution. You talk about faith. They've got more faith than we do because our faith is based on logic that we see in the scripture. But they are sincere and their sincerity is not the issue because as you know, a person can be sincere, but he can also be sincerely wrong. Okay. And let's add a caveat to this discussion that we're having on the natures of, on the laws of nature, because Bill mentioned this uh, last week, and I want to I get back to this. He said something to the effect that he said, it's easy to assume that all of the physical precepts of physics, time, and place, and the relationships between them have always been constant. He said, the Bible doesn't give us a lot to go on regarding prehistory. Therefore, Bill says, he says, I don't think it's out of line to recognize that in pre-Adamic times, things like gravity or solar radiation or many other factors were perhaps different. Isn't that interesting? And I think Bill is on to something here regarding the laws of physics during the pre-Adamic world. In fact, I'd like to take this possibility even forward in time a little bit by saying that perhaps some of the laws of physics weren't quite the same even before the flood. Because we know that things on the earth were really different before the flood than they are now after the flood. So when we talk about the laws of physics, physics and the laws of nature tonight, let's confine our discussions about these laws to the post-Adamic world and to the post-flood world. All right, let's briefly talk about gravity in our current age. This is a law that we experience in this age every second of our lives because when we talk about gravity, we can't only look at it from the point of view of how gravity kills us whenever we jump out of a 20-story building. That's the downside of gravity. There's a good side to gravity, and that is that it keeps us from floating off into space where we would die from radiation exposure, below freezing temperatures and lack of, lack of oxygen. So even though gravity can kill us, it also keeps us alive by keeping us tethered to the surface of the earth where we're safe. And these two instances are extreme examples, jumping off a building and flying off into space. But what about the little things in life that relate to gravity? Let me give, a, give you an example of something that's really trite, okay? For example, you sweep up dirt into a dustpan. You know the drill. You take the broom and you sweep the dirt into the little plastic dustpan, right? Did you know that if the gravitational pull of the earth were to be reduced by just 2%, you would have problems when using a dustpan? Because if the earth's gravity were reduced by 2%, you're sweeping the dirt into a dustpan with the force that you presently use, wouldn't send the dirt into the dustpan. It would send the dirt flying several feet past the dustpan. In other words, we rely on gravity to make the dirt land in the dustpan. And, and again, this dustpan thing, it's, it's a trite example of the effects of gravity on our lives. But I, I think these points we're gonna make on this topic are gonna be useful to us later on the show when we look into some of the biblical ideas that go along with this. Because I think we're gonna demonstrate ultimately the ingenious mind of God as we go through this topic a little further. So please, please hang in there, we're gonna get there. Let's look at another example of changing gravity. We just talked about the effects of what it would be like if gravity were 2% lighter. Let's talk about the effects of what would happen if gravity were 2% stronger than it is right now. And here's what I got off of a website called World Building. It says that if gravity were just 2% stronger, everything would become slightly heavier. And it said 2% isn't enough to make huge changes, although birds would find it, higher to, uh, uh, find it harder to fly. But it said buildings would be slightly weaker and fall more easily. Trips and falls, you know, when you trip and fall, they would become slightly more dangerous. It says this 2% increase in gravity would have interesting effects on the orbit of the planets. Suddenly, planets would not be moving fast enough to maintain their current orbit, and that would cause them to fall in towards the sun until they gain enough speed and settle into a new orbit. 
and they say that the new orbit of the Earth would almost certainly be more eccentric than our current one, and it would be shorter, so that means the length of the year would change. And, and this change in gravity would make major changes to our culture. Again, we're just talking about a 2% increase in gravity, major changes. More parts of the Earth would become difficult to inhabit. I mean, we already have difficult places to live, like the Sahara Desert, the North Pole, the South Pole. Well, with an increase in gravity by 2%, there would be more places on Earth that we couldn't inhabit because the temperature ranges would be more, uh, more extreme. Equally, the moon would shift into an eccentric orbit. Tides would grow stronger. Again, this is just with a 2% change in gravity. Now, I really am going to show how this relates to the Bible. So hang in there. We really are going to get that. But I want to remind you to please keep in mind that if you make just a small change to the laws of nature or the laws of physics, it would make major adverse changes to our environment and our living conditions. Let's talk briefly about baseball. If you were to make gravity just 2% heavier, you'd probably see, uh, you'd probably never see a home run hit out of the park. Conversely, if you were to make gravity just 2% lighter, you would see all kinds of home runs. We'd be getting triple digit scores in games. In astronomy, they have these things called the Goldilocks zone for planets. Now, what in the world is the Goldilocks zone? You remember the story of Goldilocks, the little girl. She went into the bear's home and the first porridge she ate was too hot. The second porridge she ate was too cold. And the third porridge she ate was just right. Well, using the Hubble telescope, astronomers are finding more and more planets out there in other galaxies. And every time they find a new planet, their first question is, could there be life on this planet? And they call any planet that could support human life a Goldilocks planet. Not too hot, not too cold. Not making this up. You can Google this and get more information on the subject. And the vast majority of the time when they find a planet, the answer is emphatically no. This is not a Goldilocks planet. Usually the planet is too hot. It's, or it's too cold to sustain some kind of life. And even if some planet that they find can sustain certain lower forms of life, such as an amoeba, that planet wouldn't be able to sustain human life because human life can only exist within a very narrow band of conditions. The planet not only has to be not, not too hot, not too cold, it also has to have the right pull of gravity. If the planet's real big, the gravity would be too heavy for humans to be able to function. Or if the planet's small, then the gravity for humans to be able to function would be too light. Again, there's a very narrow band where human beings can survive. And then there's water. If a planet doesn't have enough water, humanity can't live there. If a planet has too much water or, it's, or not enough land, man can't live there. The conditions have to be perfect in order for us to live there. And that's why most of the time when astronomers find a new planet, they have to sadly conclude that, don't worry about it, honey. They have to sadly conclude that this is not a Goldilocks planet where everything is just right. These laws that we have that rule every second of our lives on the planet Earth are exactly what we need to exist here. God created these laws, uh, 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 these, these natural laws. He made them perfect for us. And why is it that they're perfect for us? Why is it that the law of gravity, the law of physics are so perfect for what we humans need in order to live comfortably on this little blue orb that we call earth? Well, let's read a couple of Bible verses. Nehemiah chapter nine, verse six says, thou, even thou, means you, even you, are Lord alone. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens, and all with their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein. And you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. And how does God preserve all these things in the entirety of the universe? Through his laws of nature that are so magnificently set up. Psalm 19.1 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, 
The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The marvelous laws that we see like gravity and physics are the handiwork of God. These laws are all part of his marvelous creation. And he created these laws, why? For our benefit, so that we frail and weak human beings can participate in this wonderful thing called human life on this beautiful blue planet that God created. And you know that a lot of Bible, a lot of Bible preachers are fearful that someday scientists are gonna discover a planet that has people on it. And they, these, these preachers believe that the discovery of people on a planet somewhere would automatically disprove the Bible. And I couldn't disagree more. There's absolutely nothing that says this planet is the only place that God created human beings that are destined to be reborn into the God family. So I actually look forward to the day that they find life on another planet. I hope it happens in my lifetime. And, and do you know what the odds are that it could happen according to the theory of random selection? Well, it's like, you know, billions and billions to one. But that's the laws of random selection that man has come up with. We know that God can do anything he wants. Now, this discussion that we're having leads us to another point that we need to deal with. And let's insert something really important. We don't worship the creation. This, this is a wonderful creation that God has put together. Some religions actually worship the creation like they worship, you know, cows or sacred rocks or divine trees. That's blasphemy. We're supposed to worship the creator, not the creation. So while we don't worship God's creation, still we should stand in absolute awe of his creation because it's a reflection of him. We should marvel and appreciate and love God's creation. We should praise God continually for all that he's created. And here's where people get a little confused sometimes. They say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus said that we're in the world, but not of the world. And 1 John 2, 15 tells us, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, Love for the Father is not in them, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whatever does the will, but who, whoever does the will of God lives forever. So how do we refrain from loving the world while loving God's creation? Are we living in some kind of a theological paradox? The answer is no, because we understand what this word world is that the New Testament writers are using when they speak to us. When the writers of the New Testament tell us we are not of the world and we're, that we're not to love the world, they're not talking about the planet that we live on, this marvelous creation of God. They're talking about this age that we live in this system that we live in that was created by Satan, created by man. Because ever since the sin in the Garden of Eden, Satan has been the God of this world. We know that Satan is the God of this world or the, the God of this age, the God of the Satan, the system, because 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us this. Please write that down. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us that Satan is the God of this world. So yes, God's creation is wonderful. But it would be a whole lot more wonderful if it weren't constantly being destroyed by sinful man. We're constantly doing things that hurt the earth. We're constantly hurting the environment of the earth, however you want to say this. And the harm that we do is part of our sin. And it's one of the ways that Satan's influence over us manifests itself through our harming this beautiful earth that God created. So go ahead and love this incredible planet that God made for us. This fantastic Goldilocks planet that's so perfect for man to live on and to thrive in. But at the same time, while you're appreciating it, please repudiate the time we live in. Please repudiate the system we live in. Please repudiate the evil that, that man does in conjunction with Satan. And one final point on this, 
sometimes I wonder if it's even possible for some Christians to really enjoy God's creation. And I say that based on some of the, the sermons that I hear. And I base this on some of the co-worker letters that go out to the brethren. And here's a co-worker letter. I want to read from it that went out uh, within the last couple weeks. Let me read a couple paragraphs. It says, we are living in a world filled with conflicts, moral degradation, and in our Western world, a lack of awareness of God. God is lampooned at every turn. And those who stand up for morality and godly values are equally despised and put down. Where this is leading is not good. God will not put up with this depravity forever. Dear brethren and co-workers, let us work while it is day, for the night is coming when no one can work. Jesus referred to his own work. But he, if he's living among us and within us, it must surely be a message for us to take the heart. The work, still quoting from the letter, the work he refers to is the works of him who sent me. God calls us to do a work. It is difficult to see in every detail how events will play out, but free speech is under assault. Let us work the work of God while we have time, and thank you for your prayers and your generous support, end quote. In other words, they're saying the world's money is evil, so send it to us. You don't need that money, so give it to us. And you know we don't say that on, on Start Our Sabbath, because we don't accept money, we don't ask you for money. When people send us money, we send it back. We don't want your money. But some of these preachers out there want to tell you how bad the world is, your money is no good to the world. It's no good for you. Send it to us. And some of these preachers can never find anything good going on in the world. And there's a lot of bad in the world. But there's some good in the world. They say that just about everything is just totally evil. But, you know, just once in a while, it might be a good idea for us to recognize the beauty of what God has given us, his wonderful creation. In other words, we should be a people who see the glass as half full and not half empty because these purveyors of doom and gloom are really good at seeing the glass half empty. In my personal experience, there are a lot of nice people out there in the world. Imperfect, yes, but nice. And I include you in that. You are a bunch of nice people. There are kind and caring people out there, but you don't hear about these people from some of the preachers that are out there. Instead, they want to want, want to teach you that you're some kind of a victim, some kind of a martyr that the rest of the world hates. And they talk about how Jesus is going to return and he's going to wreak vengeance on all these people. And they say that since you support their gloom and doom ministry with all your money, then that means in the kingdom of God, you're going to get to take part in the vengeance that Jesus is going to rain down on all these people. This is all part of the headline theology message. It began in the early 1800s with William Miller, and it's still with us today. This doom and gloom headline theology is just a tapeworm on the teachings of the ecclesia. Now, notice that I did not say that those who promote headline theology are tapeworms. No, no. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're just misled into believing that preaching headline theology is preaching the gospel when it's not. So no, these people are not tapeworms. Their teachings are tapeworms. This tapeworm theology gets in the way of promoting love for God's creation. It keeps us from loving our neighbor. It keeps us from being able to promote the positive message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then our young people in the church, they pick up on this tapeworm theology. And while the young people it may not always be able to put a finger on what's wrong in the church, they intuitively sense that whenever a group promotes doom and gloom headline theology, the group is missing out on the teachings and the message of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. So I have to ask the question, is it just possible that this type of tapeworm message is the reason that many of them our kids, is this the reason that they've been walking out the doors and never coming back to our church? We have no business preaching health and wealth gospel. No, we, we shouldn't do that. We have no business doing away with the law of tithing. But come on, let's stop with the message of send us as much money as you can so we can tell everyone how horrible the world really is. Let's stop 
with the message of, we in the ministry obviously are not good stewards of your tithes, so we have to ask you to send in more and more money, and you don't even have the money, but we want you to sacrifice, sacrifice more and more for us. Wouldn't it be better if our message was more like this? We hope that you tithe to us because you believe that we teach God's truth. We believe in tithing. We believe it's an act of worship like prayer, Bible study, fasting and prayer. But after you tithe, don't feel guilty about spending your other money on your family, taking them places, doing nice things with them, maybe eating out once in a while. And if you can't afford to help the poor after you've sent us your tithe because you're poor, keep in mind that our church is helping the poor because, because our mission statement isn't only preaching the gospel and feeding the flock. We also help the poor. So as an organization, we do that. Wouldn't it be nice if that was the message that was being sent out to all the brethren? We've got to stop this business of taking a family that's already tithing and then trying to wring even more money out of them for the purposes purpose of getting on more and more radio stations or putting out more and more booklets and magazines that promote gloom and doom. Headline theology is a dead-end street. Now, sure, we don't have the kingdom of God on this earth at this time. We don't have it. But we are ambassadors for that kingdom. So let's enjoy God's creation. Let's encourage our kids to enjoy God's creation. Let's let others see us as positive, happy people. Let the world see us as a people of Christian love as we keep God's law. In other words, let's constantly let our light shine in this age so that we might glorify Jesus. Okay, Nancy's going to come over here and tell us what's going on in the chat room. Uh, you want to do it? Yeah, do it on camera. Can you, can you move over here? In the meantime, let me give you a quick reminder of something while Nancy's getting set up because we want to hear your comments and your thoughts, and then we're going to go over to uh, Kelly. I want to remind you, we never ask for money on this show. We don't accept your money. We ask for two things from you. We ask for your prayers. Mm -hmm. So please be praying about this show all the time. That's what we ask for. Because we start and, prepping tomorrow. Yeah, we, we'll, we will start next week's show tomorrow. We don't wait till Friday afternoon to start working on the show. We start right. on the show tomorrow, Sunday, and work on it so all week. So you start praying about it on so, Sunday too. So you start praying <laughs> as we're working. That's the first thing we ask for. And the second thing we ask for is hit the share button. button. If you're watching on Facebook, <clears throat> if you're getting anything out of this show, then you probably got friends who can get things out of this show. Hit the share button and share this show with them or tell them to go to dynamicchristianministries.org and you can uh, watch the replay um, on the uh, YouTube link. Okay, Nancy, what have you got for us in the chat First, room? First, I'm going to shout out to those on YouTube, Barb Shea, Trudy Cranford, Al Bundy 54, Alfred Hensel, and Nigel M18, as well as uh, Mimi and Carl who are monitoring over there. Wonderful. Um, we have Michelle um, Grimm from Northern California. All right. Priscilla Hawkins says hi. Uh, Rev Ayab Shadik says uh, very nice. Clement Raj is Welcome. watching. Good. Victor John uh, says greetings from Pakistan. All right. From Pakistan. Thank you so much for tuning in from Pakistan. We appreciate that you're here. Mark Silas from Paducah, Kentucky. We appreciate you being here, too, from Paducah. P.S. Eric, Rebecca Sneed, Rose uh, Mabane, uh, Rubab Farouk, Benita Miller, Roger Martin. Let's see. I talked about some of these people already. Uh, Shako Tawil, Alma Sousa. Uh, Peter Kamen, Maria Manning, uh, Peter says, happy Sabbath from Lugiland, uh, which is Long Island. Okay. okay. Uh, Ron Kolb is watching us. Jocelyn Cortana says, happy Sabbath. Uh, Xavier Sand Hope says, ha happy peaceful Sabbath to Th you. Thank you. You too. Francis Sanapati mm. is watching. Uh, Alan McCarty. Uh, let's see, uh, Dan Krantz, Bradley Kennedy, Barbara Clayton, uh, Edward Harding says we're dealing with geographic faith, which is uh, protective, even though an error. 
I'm not sure what that is. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to think about that one. Khalid uh, Navid is with us. Hi. Uh, Masi Hardiv uh, says, Dear friend, good morning <coughs> and much love. Uh, Theda Horton's watching. Uh, Jenny Orgel. Bill Lucenheis said he would like to be 2% lighter. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Ariel Melkor is watching. Uh, Ariel. <coughs> that's our good buddy in um, oh. Church God Seventh Day. Right. In uh, Tyler, Texas. Yes, Hi, we had a brother. great time yeah. with them. Yes. And they provided a nice translator for us. Wonderful Sabbath service. Yes. Paso vos, hermano. Okay. Uh, George Theodore, let's see, Mita Rosas from Southern California, mm -hmm. Shamarus Mashish mm -hmm. says, God bless you, Melissa Kerr is watching, Nadine George, uh, Robert Giovi, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, Mike Simple says, Deuteronomy 4.32 says, the earth is the only place God has created hu human life okay. and performing his great plan. All right. There you go. John Freeman's watching, Faye Brown. Chanel Campbell, uh, John Luis or or Segura, uh, Debbie Whitcomb is with us, Asia Lavender, Daryl Ambrose. I know I saw Wayne Weiss here somewhere. I can't find him now. Victor he probably Donald. fell asleep. At I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to miss him. I know. I saw he was listed here, and I just thought <laughs> I don't see him, and I, and I don't want to miss him. He went to bed. Richard Mendez <laughs> says Happy Sabbath from Fre Fremont. Uh, Nebraska, uh, James Burns says the Sermon on the Mount is the gospel. Indeed it is. Yes, it is. Praise God for it. We need more of the Sermon on the Mount to be taught. Right, right. Okay. All right, uh, let's uh, put a bookmark in there, and okay. we're going to go to Kelly now because okay. um, we're running out of time. As you know, let me get this cough well, drop out of my mouth. We're going to start coughing now. So yeah. gonna leave. We're still suffering from the cough. As you know, we've got a special treat for you tonight, and let me introduce this next segment by telling you about a super organization that's out there. It's called the Bible Sabbath Association. And for short, we call it BSA. Not Boy Scouts of America, but Bible Sabbath Association. The BSA uh, was started in the 1940s in Fairfield, Oklahoma. It's basically an organization that services uh, all Christians who are Sabbath keepers. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist or uh, Church God Seventh-day, whatever, the BSA website has some really good information, and one of the many things that it has is information about how to protect your job if you keep the Sabbath day. Because a lot of people who are new to keeping the Sabbath don't always know that just because you're a Sabbath keeper doesn't mean you give up your rights. Your boss may not like it that you keep the Sabbath day. He may want to fire you, but it's not that simple. You have your rights. And of course, your rights vary from country to country because we've got people watching the show from all over the world. Anyway, the Bible Sabbath Association might be able to help you with information about this. They also published a magazine called the Sabbath Sentinel, and they have another good publication called the Directory of Sabbath Keeping Groups. And tonight on this show, we have the president of the Bible Sabbath Association. His name is Kelly McDonald. Kelly, welcome to the show. Good evening. Good evening. I just want to thank you guys for having me on. It's truly an honor. Well, the pleasure is ours, and we are so glad. I understand that you're going to talk about Emperor Constantine tonight. Is that correct? That's correct. I am. Okay. Uh, go for it. We're dying. We've been uh, looking forward to this all week. Sounds great. Well, uh, I want to talk about Constantine tonight. You know, there's a lot of uh, speculation about Constantine. Was he a... Christian emperor? Was he a pagan emperor? Was he a syncretist? And what we're going to do is kind of cut through some of the traditions and some of the uh, uh, um, popular thought about Constantine, and we're just going to get right to the heart of the matter. Now, before we can really understand Constantine and the reign of Constantine, we want to take just a few moments and give you just a little bit of background information. From 64 AD until about 13, uh, 312 313 A.D., in that time period, there were about 10 persecutions of Christians by Roman emperors. And Christians were brutally treated during this time period. The first Roman emperor to uh, have a top-down persecution of Christians was the Emperor Nero, about 64 A.D. Um, but there were, there were many other Roman emperors who tried to hunt down Christians and kill them and stamp them out. And 
But about 312, 313, things begin to change. And it all started with a battle that is commonly called the Battle of Milvin Bridge. Uh, in 312 AD, Constantine battled uh, a man named Maxentius for control of the Roman Empire. Now, it is believed by two contemporary historians that Constantine, before this battle with Maxentius, which again is commonly called the Battle of Milvin Bridge, uh, before this battle, it is believed that he had a supernatural or spiritual experience. And uh, one contemporary, his name is Eusebius of Caesarea, he wrote and said that just before the battle, Constantine looked in the sky and he had a vision. And uh, this vision was during the day, and he saw a cross, and, and he, he saw uh, 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 and, and beside it that by this sign you shall conquer and be victorious. And so uh, uh, the story goes on from this contemporary that he had all his troops and uh, paint and, and decorate their shields and battle standards with crosses, and that's one contemporary. Another contemporary source is a man named Lex. Uh, Lactantius, who was actually a personal tutor for one of Constantine's sons. He stated uh, something a little different. He said that Constantine had a dream where he saw the first two letters of Christ's name, which are Chi and Rho. Uh, it would look like an X and a P to us today. That he saw these two letters, and he decided to put those on the battle standards and fought with that sign. And so we have two, con two contemporaries that give a little bit different accounting, but they both came to the same conclusion in their mind that Constantine had a visitation with Jesus, and uh, we know from history that Constantine went on to beat Maxentius. Yeah. Now, what is fascinating is that Constantine actually built an arch to commemorate his victory over Maxentius in the year 315 A.D., that's about three years after his victory over Maxentius. What's fascinating is there's no crosses on this uh, arch. There's no engravings of the Cairo. There's no mention of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to read to you the inscription that's written on it. I'm going to read to you the English, not the Latin. Uh, but the English says this. To the Emperor Flavius Constantine the Great, pious and fortunate, the Senate and people of Rome, because by divine inspiration of his own greatness of spirit, with his army on both the tyrant and all his factions, at once in rightful battle he avenged the state and dedicated this arch as a mark of triumph. What is interesting is that he does have uh, um, dedications to Hercules, Apollo, Diana, and Sylvanus carved into the arch, but no mention of Christ. So we can kind of cut through some of the uh, 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 myths because you see many Catholics and even Protestants believe that Constantine was the first Christian emperor. And the Catholic Church, Catholic Church in particular teaches that Constantine's vision before the Battle of Milvin Bridge was the moment of his conversion. But let me just say this. If Constantine did have a legitimate experience with Christ and in his mind, that was the reason why he had victory. It would have been commemorated on the Arch of Constantine. But as we read in the English translation, he uh, uh, attributes it to his own acuity and skill in battle, and he even commemorates some of the pagan gods of Rome. So let's talk about who the real Constantine is. And we want to use some primary source evidence and even archaeological evidence to prove this. And I want to read to you uh, an excerpt. Um, give me just a, one moment. I want to read you an excerpt from an edict called the Edict of Milan. It was uh, written in 313 A.D. This is about a year, a little less, after his victory over Maxentius. And here's what Constantine said. It was proper that the Christians and all others should have liberty to follow that mode of religion which appeared best to each person, that no man should be denied leave of attaching himself to the rights of the Christians or to whatever religion his mind directed him, that the supreme deity to whose worship we freely devote ourselves might continue to vouchsafe his favor and beneficence to us. 
Now, when we think about what was just stated in the Edict of Milan, this, this is just a quote out of the Edict of Milan. It's not the whole quote uh, or the whole edict. Notice that he says, not only does he allow Christians to worship freely, but he says, he says, I wish everybody freedom to worship whatever God, whatever religion you want to worship. And so he's kind of a pantheist, you know, you just pray to all the gods and it will kind of pan out. And uh, um, this is the kind of attitude that Constantine had when he issued the Edict of Milan. Now, let me give you just a little bit more historical background to uh, of the Edict of Milan. You see, the Roman Empire was under a tremendous amount of stress. It was uh, lacking money. It was lacking troops. It was lacking in, in many resources. It was fighting on multiple frontiers. It was breaking down. Constantine needed to do something, and he needed to do something quickly. So here's what he did. Instead of hunting down Christians like the emperors before him, he said, you know what, I'm going to act like I'm one of them. And I'm going to act like I'm on their side. And so from his perspective, he was a, it was a genius political move. Uh, even though from a, a Christian standpoint, it was a terrible move to promote all religions, obviously. But if you look at situation from his perspective, from his perspective, he's got, there's a subgroup of people in the empire called Christians who are going to pay their taxes and they're going to, uh, uh, so they're, they're not going to try and kill me. Maybe I should just act like I'm one of them, and they'll join the army, and they'll uh, uh, be good public servants. And that's exactly what he did. Hmm. Now, I want to read to you one more, uh, uh, one more edict of Constantine's. Then we're going to get into some artifacts from history. Um, in March 7th, 321 A.D., Constantine issued the famous Sunday Law. And here's what it says. It says, all judges, city dwellers, skill workers, and the offices of all should honor the venerable day of the sun. Or in Latin, it reads, venerabilis deus solus. Or the, that means the honorable or the venerable day of the sun and rest. However, those placed in the country freely serve the fields of culture. So we can see that Constantine set apart the first day of the week as a day of rest, not to honor Jesus, not to honor God, but to honor the sun. And uh, we know from history that uh, Sunday was the day of worship in Mithra's worship. And so having looked at these facts here, these statements from Constantine, we can see that he really is not a Christian. He displays no fruits of the Spirit, but instead he displays the fruits of a syncretist, one who blends elements of Christianity with elements of paganism to create its own religion. So now what we want to transition to, if you'll go to slide one with me, um, can you hear me, with? Yeah, it's there. Okay, sir. Okay, sorry. I'm on a delay feed where I'm at. Excuse me. Yeah. All right. So if we look at uh, this first slide, we see a coin, and on the left side there you see Constantine's likeness, and you can see IMP Constantius. And then it says AVG, that means Imperator Constantius, and then AVG is Augustus. Okay, that's one side of the coin. On the other side, we see, uh, we see uh, that is actually Jupiter, and the Latin inscription is Iovi Conservatory. And that means, in Latin, Jupiter conserves. Iovi, or Jove, was a short name for Jupiter. And so here Constantine, in 313 A.D., less than a year after his supposed conversion, is giving honor to Jupiter. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, we look at this next slide. Now you can't see this slide as well as the previous one because this, these are actually ancient coins that we're looking at, and this one is just a little bit more worn down. But you can see on the left side that's Constantine. Um, that's his likeness with Imperial IMP Constantius AVG. And then on the right side, we see Iovi Conservatory, and there's the same picture of Jupiter before. Now, the reason why I show you another coin is because this one was minted in 321 to 324 A.D. This is um, over a decade after his supposed conversion, because some people with the Catholic Church would look at the first coin and say, well, he hadn't had time to change everything. Well, here's 10 years later. He's had plenty of time 
he's still giving honor to Jupiter. Let's go to the next coin. Uh, this is what I'm about to show you is fascinating. This is a picture of three coins, and I own all of these coins. On the far left, you see the back side of a coin minted by Alexander the Great, and you see that is Zeus sitting down, and he's got an eagle uh, in one hand and in the other hand a staff. Okay, that's Alexander the Great's coin. The coin in the middle, that's Antiochus IV, who we commonly call Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, he's the, the central character of the Hanukkah story. And we can see there's Zeus again. And in one hand, Zeus has got the goddess Nike with a victory wreath standing on top of the world in the hand of Zeus. And then in the other hand, a staff. Okay? And then on the far right, we see the coin from Constantine. And what do you see here? You see, it's the same deity. Jupiter is the Roman equivalent of Zeus. And we see the almost the exact same figure. The only difference is in Constantine's uh, picture, uh, Zeus is, or Jupiter is standing up. But you still see Nike in one hand with the victory wreath standing on a globe and, and Jupiter's hand representing the world and then a staff in the other hand. So you can see that... Constantine is continuing in the tradition of pagan worship that went back hundreds and even thousands of years. He's in no way trying to break from it. So let's go to another example. And again, these are coins that Constantine minted. Uh, the next coin on this slide is very fascinating because um, on one side, again, we see Constantine's likeness, and it says uh, Constantius, and then it's got... Uh, PF, and then AVG, which is Augustus. And then on the other side, we see um, this is Sol Invictus on the other side, and it says in the Latin, it says Sol Invicto Comite, which means Sol Invictus accompanies me, or Sol Invictus is my companion. And uh, you can see Sol Invictus has the world in, in one hand, the globe in one hand, and this crown. It has the uh, uh, a toga dra uh, draped over one shoulder. And so this coin was minted in 317 A.D. That's about five years after the Catholic Church claims he converted. And here's the key about this coin. It was minted in Trier. Trier is a city that was on the French-German border. And Trier was actually the resident city of Constantine. So this is Constantine minting a coin in his own city that he's living in five years after he has supposedly converted. And he's saying that Sol Invictus, the invincible sun god is his companion. Doesn't sound too Christian to me. Let's go to the next slide because I want to show you another. Uh, I want to show you an actual uh, uh, Roman emperor that no one would argue was pagan because he absolutely 100% is. His name is Gordian the Third. He ruled from 238 to 244 A.D. We see on one side Gordian's likeness. On the other side, guess who that is? That is Sol Invictus. And he, his inscription says Orange AVG, which means the rising sun of Augustus. And so Constantine is continuing to mint coins with these pagan deities on it. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it actually compares the two side by side. You can see on the left, you see Gordian III's coin of Sol Invictus. And on the right, you see Constantine's coin of Sol Invictus. It is the same deity. They both honored um, very plain, isn't it? Here's another coin, and uh, I'm going to go through these last few coins. Um, this next coin, uh, again, has Constantine's likeness, IMP, Constantius, and then it has AVG at the end. On the other side of the coin, though, it says in Latin, and I'll just give you the uh, English translation, it says, the victory wreath for the eternal prince, and he's got two goddesses offering incense on a Roman altar, and it has VOT, which represents the vows of the Roman people. And so here, here Constantine's calling himself the eternal prince. Well, if we read the Bible, you know, we know there's only, there's the prince of peace, but Constantine is not called the eternal prince in the Bible. So, uh, in fact, no man is. <laughs> so we can see here that this is six, seven years after his supposed conversion, he is deifying himself. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this coin um, is from 330 to 335 A.D., so this is almost to the end of Constantine's life. And let's see, who is he honoring at toward the end of his life? We see on one side Constantine's face, 
his likeness. But then on the other side, we see a battle standard with two soldiers, and in Latin it says Gloria Exercitus, which means for the glory of the army. Not for the glory of God, but for the glory of the army. We'll go to the next slide, and we'll see here's another Constantine coin. I think we only have a few more left. Uh, this Constantine coin is from 327 to 328 A.D., so again, we're talking 15, 16 years after his supposed conversion. We see Constantine, um, there's his face, and notice his eyes in this coin. It's very interesting. His eyes are looking up, um, as if he's looking up to the heavens or to the gods. And on the back side of this coin, now this is a very rare coin. It's hard to find. It says, Gloria Romanorum, Gloria, or for the glory of Rome, and there's Rome depicted as a woman sitting on a battle shield with Nike in her hand, representing victory, holding a victory wreath, and standing on top of the globe, which is in the woman's hand. And uh, fascinating that Rome is depicted as a woman. Uh, another chapter in the Bible where uh, uh, a city on seven hills or seven mountains is depicted as a woman, but that's another message for another day. We'll go to the next slide. This coin has, again, Constantine on one side, and then on the other side, it says in Latin, Our Lord Constantine Maximus Augustus. And so here, Constantine, this coin was minted in 320 to 321 A.D., uh, uh, was to honor Constantine as Lord. But we know from the Bible that uh, uh, we must confess that Jesus is Lord, not that Constantine is Lord. And so, again, going against what is written in the Scriptures, if you'll go to the next slide, we're going to finish by talking about the Cairo for just a moment. Um, after uh, the time of Constantine, the Cairo starts showing up uh, in various places throughout the Roman Empire, and it was passed off as a Christian symbol because the Chi, which is represented by the X there, that the K sound is the first letter of Christ's name in Greek, and then the Rho, which looks like a P there, uh, is the second letter, and it was used to try and symbolize Christ, and one of the primary sources of Constantine's time actually said that Constantine saw this sign in the heavens, or he actually had a dream of it, and he had victory because of this sign. But I want you to understand that this sign is pagan in origin, and I want you to go to the next slide. So before you go there, let's look at this uh, Magnetius slide uh, before we go to that last one. 353 A.D., he was a Roman emperor, and again, they were trying to pass off the Cairo as a Christian symbol, okay? So that's 353 A.D. Let's look at the next slide. This is a coin of Ptolemy III. This is a coin of Ptolemy III. Now, he was a, one of the Greek rulers of the Kingdom of the South from the uh, Book of Daniel, which we would have called the Ptolemaic Kingdom. And it was minted between 246 and 222 B.C. This ruler is mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. On one side, that is the face of Zeus. And on the second side, so we see the face of Zeus on the one side. And on the second side, we see an eagle. But if you look just between the eagle's legs, you'll see the chi Rho symbol. So once again, the Cairo was a symbol that was borrowed from paganism. It was not a symbol that originated with uh, Constantine's victory over Maxentius because Constantine, over the course of his life, you know, he did not display fruits of being a Christian. He had his oldest son, Crispus, was killed. He actually had him killed. He had his second wife killed. And he uh, allowed paganism to continue in the empire when Constantine was, uh, Constantinople was dedicated in 330 A.D. He allowed shrines to pagan gods to be erected in the city. And so we can see from these examples that Constantine, at best, was a syncretist. And so that's uh, just, just my presentation for tonight. That's the conclusion of it, just kind of giving you primary source evidence, people who lived in the time of Constantine and archaeological artifacts from that time period to show you who the real Constantine was. Very good. Fascinating stuff. These uh, visual aids were fantastic. I appreciate this. I got a question for you. Um, what do you think the long-term effect is on Constantine's reign to Christianity? Absolutely. I think that's an excellent question, by the way. You see, until the time of Constantine, Christians were hated 
by Roman emperors for the most part. She did have some in between that had favor on Christian people, but, um, but there were persecutions, as we talked about earlier. Here's what Constantine did. Constantine said, well, we're not going to hunt you down and kill you. We're just going to act like you're on our team. And so he began to syncretize Christianity. And so here's the long-term effect that had. Christians started to become, a, it, it became popular and advantageous to be a Christian, especially as Roman emperors began to co-opt Christianity as the quote-unquote religion of the empire. And so what that did was it uh, hurt Christianity long-term because Christianity began to just absorb pagan symbols and practices and quote-unquote Christianize them instead of being set apart even if they were persecuted. Very good. Thank you so much, Kelly. This has been fantastic. And now, don't leave yet um, in case Nancy gets any questions in the chat room, okay? And while Nancy's getting her stuff together, I want to let you know that we want to announce that Kelly is coming back onto the show on May 11th, and not electronically, but he's going to be here in person right here in the studio. Wow, that is, never happens. Th th isn't that right, Kelly? May 11th? That's right. And also on the show that night, we're going to have Bill Lucenhide. Oh, I won't get any airtime then. No, you get no airtime that night. And Jeff Reed will be in the studio what? that night. On SOS? On SOS. We're wow. going to have all those guys here. They're all going to give uh, presentations. So the show could go on till 3 o'clock in the morning, the way these guys talk. No, I'm just kidding. And then, uh, so anyway, you that's... Better order more pizza. Yeah, we better get a lot more pizza. So that will be May 11th. It's going to be a special SOS. Then the next morning on May 12th, Kelly is going to be preaching the sermon in Tyler, at Church of God International. Wonderful. That's at 11 o'clock Central Time. And then we hope in the afternoon, we don't know this for sure, we're still trying to get this worked out. Kelly, we hope, is going to be preaching in the Tyler Church of God Seventh Day. Um, so we're still working on that. So that is going to be one really, really cool weekend. And we're looking forward to seeing you, Kelly, uh, along with Bill Lucenheide. Looking forward to seeing you guys too. Okay, Nancy, what do you got for us in the chat room? Well, I don't uh, have any questions. Uh, just Debbie Whitcomb says, thanks, Kelly. Uh, Dan Krantz wants to know if all the people of old uh, thought the world was flat, why is the world shown as a globe on all those coins? Excellent point. Why is that? And we know the answer. And, and, and uh, that's a rhetorical question. The, the people of ancient times were not um, uh, ignorant. They didn't think that the world was flat. Mm -hmm. That's just some silliness that came into Europe uh, during the Dark Ages. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be able to get in all, you know, mention all these names, but I want to say that uh, Ama Sosa said she was praying for us already and she shared. So thank uh, you. She yeah. listened to us. Thank you for hitting the share button. Who said that? Uh, Alma, Alma Sosa. Alma. Thank you, Alma. And all the rest of you out there, please hit the share button for us. We got. Angelina Whitney from uh, Newburgh, Oregon. Faye Brown from LaRue, Texas. Faye Brown of the famous chili cook-off. She won first, first place. place. Winner. Yes. First yes. place. And did you see the size of that trophy? Was, we should have had a picture of that. She has some help that. carrying that to the car. She, that's right. She's going to get a hernia carrying that yeah, big trophy yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. Um, Who else you got in there? Okay. So Marion Young Perkins said she shared too. So good. Uh, Ana Yancey Ramos from Florida says hello. Richard Meese, Karen Weiss, that rhymes, Richard Meese and Karen Weiss. Uh, Jerry Kaiser. A lot of new people tonight. So, lot, tons of new people. Yep, Raymond no Noonan says. Thank you so much for being with us, all you new new people. Hope you, yeah. We hope you got something out of this, and we hope you come back next Friday night. And Bill Lucenhide said Constantine was a fake Christian. I think that's a reference to fake news. And actually, I don't think it sounds like he wasn't even trying to be a Christian. We just the Catholic Church was trying to make him a Christian. It sure sounds like. It. Would you agree with that, Kelly? Yes, uh, I would agree that Constantine. He just kind of was playing him along, you know. <laughs> and the, the Catholic Church is trying to impose this image on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, isn't that interesting? So we got Tim Rose, uh, Jai Shankar, uh, George O'Hand. Wow, so many new people. Yep. I probably yep. missed some. Well, okay. 
Uh, do we have any other comments or questions? Any complaints? Anybody mad tonight and saying uh, you guys taught a bunch of heresy? And, no. Because mm -mm. remember, lots of, lots of likes and loves and and hopefully shares. Good. And remember, anytime you want to disagree with us, we don't mind if you disagree. You know, do it in love. Try not to call me names because it'll hurt my feelings. But uh, disagree, and and we can disagree and do it uh, agreeably, like Christians. We except we, for you, Bill. No disagreeing. Yeah, Bill, us. you cannot disagree with anything. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, <laughs> no. uh, uh, oh, there, there's the coffin starting. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's, uh, I'll read this little joke because I think it's funny. The, uh, scientists cross a potato with a sponge. It tastes horrible, but it really soaks up the gravy. Oh, boy, that's very practical. Who sent you that? That, that was from Al Bundy 59. Al the, Bundy, thank you room. so much, Al Bundy 59. So, okay, if we don't have anything else, we, we want to remind you to come back next Friday night at 8 o'clock Central Time in the U.S. And um, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. but you got to uh, be kidding. You probably have reams of paper already written up. Yeah, but I haven't selected what we're going to talk well, about. Well, I know what I'm talking about because it's been on hold two weeks Oh, yeah, now. don't say it yet. Okay, no, I'm let's not going to say it, it right. but at least I okay. know what I'm talking about. So we're, we're going to start working on the program tomorrow. So you come back next right. Friday night, 8 o'clock Central Time in the U.S., uh, we want to uh, thank Carl Nachtree for the wonderful work he does. Thank you so much, Kelly uh, McDonald, for the fantastic presentation tonight. We're looking forward to seeing you on May 11th live in person. We're going to get all of us here at this big table. We're going to have a great show. But come back next week. We're going to have another show for you. That's uh, right. And go to newchurchlady.org. Learn all about the Women's Conference and register, please, ladies. And, no men. Register, ladies. All right. And let's have a closing prayer, let's okay? Do. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we were able to learn so many things tonight. Help us, Father, to take this knowledge that we have so that we can be better Christians and we can be better in our obedience to you and better in our love that we have for our brothers. Father, help us to have uh, love for all people. Help us to have forgiveness for our enemies. Help us to uh, put aside things that have been done to us and to return uh, good when evil is done to us. So help us to let our light shine so that we might glorify you. We thank you so much for this beautiful, wonderful Sabbath day that you've given to us. Help us to conduct ourselves in ways that are pleasing to you. And so uh, we ask for your dismissal and we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Now, for those of you Amen. who uh, can go to church tomorrow, please go to church mm -hmm. and uh, fellowship on the Sabbath. That's right. And as you do it, have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. All right. See you next week. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, so are you going to eat those cookies? I'm going to have some cookies. More junk food? More junk food, yeah. All right. Kelly, like good for you. we're still live and we haven't hit the uh, end button, so be careful what you say. <laughs> you still there, Kelly? I'm still here. Okay. All right. I'm going to go turn off the show. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Thank you for being here. All right. Let me hit the uh, button here. Wave bye, Nancy.